This is the Legacy Radio Network. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen, and we are chatting today with Mr. Ian Gordon of the Long Wave Group. Ian, in the last segment, uh, you mentioned that um, you're still a deflationist. And I would like you, just in very basic terms, to explain to our listeners, maybe that are even a bit confused by the two terms, deflation and inflation, how can we have deflation when the central banks are printing money? It just seems so contrary. Well, it is, actually. I mean, you know, the real true definition of, it, of inflation is an increase in the money supply. Um, and deflation is a de- effectively a decrease. But what I'm saying here is that as fast as you're trying to increase the money supply, money is coming out of the economy as debt is either repaid or through bankruptcies and so on. So all that all that money is is sort of the inflation money is fighting against the deflation money, money being taken out of the economy. Uh, and the debt by its very nature is deflationary because that money has to sort of either be paid back or people go bankrupt and and we have a, a massive amount of debt in the system. I mean, a very easy example to see that is the, you know, it, it, is the basically what's happened to home prices in the United States because uh, they were leveraged to such a huge extent that all that debt is uh, being forced out of the, out of the home, out of the home prices, mortgages are you know, a lot of people have uh, basically walked out of their homes, can't afford to pay the mortgages and so on. So all that money is coming out of the system. And um, so as fast as you're trying to create it, more is coming out, and that is deflationary. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Let's let's talk about potential real-world consequences for our listeners. Um, give us your outlook for just some asset classes here. and Let's start with, with stocks, not only... Uh, our listeners here in the United States, not only uh, the U.S. stock market indices, but worldwide. What's your What's your prediction? What are you advising your readers uh, as far as stocks are concerned? Well, we're very negative on the stock market. I mean, uh, yes, these quantitative easing programs are a, are a big help to stock prices, and and I think uh, the central banks around the world uh, are very keen to see stock prices uh, rising and. Part of the part of that is is basically done through things like quantitative easing, where money is pumped into the banks. I mean, the, the supposed uh, nature of that money printing is to hopefully get they're hoping that the banks will lend it back, and so we'll get the economy going back, going again. But the banks aren't lending because there really aren't very very good suitable borrowers out there anymore. So they're using the money that, that uh, the Federal Reserve or the B- Bank of England is making available and using that money to essentially speculate in the stock markets. And we know that both Bernanke and, and before him, Greenspan, were very keen to see uh, rising stock prices because uh, high stock prices are sort of associated with wealth. People feel good when they, you know, they can see that the stock market is uh, relatively doing relatively well so that they will go out and spend money and that's the, what they're trying to do but eventually you know the stock market has to reflect the reality of the economy and uh, in and we're very bearish I mean uh, the winter we are in the winter of the of the cycle the payback period of the cycle the depression deflationary depression stage of the cycle and we believe that the stock market will do much as it did between 1929 and 1932, where essentially it lost 90% of its value. And, and you know, we still believe that we're going to see a similar kind of uh, problems in the stock market. And we have a, on the Dow a target of 1,000 uh, for the Dow bottom. So it's going to be pretty horrendous uh, when the stock market does make its break. So, Ian, give us your view on, and what are you advising your listeners on, uh, let, let's just talk in big general terms, first government bonds and then corporate bonds. Oh, well, again, we're very negative on on those, too, because uh, the government is uh, re- really, particularly, say, the U.S. government is $16 trillion now in debt. That money can never be uh, repaid. It's an 
impossible so that uh, we see that government bonds or corporate bonds because we, we were very negative on the economy as a whole are not going to perform well corporations are going to be in, in trouble the governments are going to be in trouble and uh, if you look at countries like the United States or the United Kingdom and even Canada to some extent the you know once we, we see what happens to government bonds when we look at countries like Greece and Spain and Portugal and Ireland and so on, we see that people don't have any faith and don't want to lend those countries money, so interest rates rise. Well, that's going to happen once those countries have basically succumbed and the euro has, uh, has fallen apart. The attention, as I said earlier, is going to be focused on countries like the United Kingdom and the United States, and they're Therefore, those interest rates will be forced up. So we're, we're negative on bonds. And I guess the last asset class, Ian, I'd like to get your, your view on would be gold. Well, I've, I've been very bullish on gold actually since 2000 because that's when we believe the, the long wave winter uh, began in 2000. And we know that uh, during the winter, during the economic and financial upheaval that occurs during the long wave winter, that gold performs exceptionally well. It did exceptionally well in the in the 1930s. Uh, uh, the gold stocks particularly did well because the gold price was fixed at that time um, because uh, we were on a gold exchange standard system. But the gold stocks performed exceptionally well in the 30s. And uh, we've been bullish on gold since 2000. And we remain very, very bullish on gold, we, you know, because ultimately we see it as the, as the real money. Ian, in the time we have left, let's talk about Europe. You've uh, um, talked about um, uh, the fact that uh, you believe the euro will not survive as a currency, and certainly Spanish banks now, it was reported this last week, are seeing uh, a run. I think the loan-to-deposit ratio now is up to about 190%. Bonds issued by Spanish banks have interest rates spiking. Are Greece and Spain now officially in a depression well, I think so. I mean, you've got 25% unemployment. That's similar to the unemployment rate in um, uh, in the United States during the Great Depression. So uh, I don't think anyone could argue that they're not in a depression. I mean, their economies are negative. Uh, their unemployment is simply uh, devastating. Youth unemployment in both countries is close to 50%. So, yes, they're in a depression. There's no doubt about it. Ian, if you take a look, uh, the German Constitutional Court recently issued a ruling in support of the European Stability Fund. Um, is this just kicking the can down the road a little bit further? And uh, how does this affect uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, uh, re-election bid? I, I, I'm seeing that the German electorate is not very happy with this. Well, I think, you know, the Constitutional Court ruling was actually, there was there were limitations imposed so that Germany could only, uh, I think, uh, spend, uh, I, I, I've forgotten the number, but it was something like 190 billion uh, euros, and anything over and above that had to go be, be put through the German parliament. So, uh, the, you know, I, I'm not sure that it is kicking the can down the road. It, it's just, you know, it's sort of limiting the amount of exposure that Germany has. And, um, and uh, so um, I think, that, you know, Germany is probably, you know, one of the things that, you know, I read today was that, you know, we're, we're looking at, the, you know, Germany but not having attained what it, it could have attained in the, in the two world wars, you know, now sort of getting Europe, a lot of the Europe, uh, simply by trying to buy Europe and, buy, you know, sort of manage the debt, the European debt, but that, I think that's a, an overwhelming system, even for Germany. You know, the debt is so horrific that uh, it, I just don't think it can happen. So I think Angela Merkel's, uh, well, you know, I think people admire her, so I think in her re-election next year, I think she still has a very good chance. Ian, in the, in the time we have left, and we have about three minutes left, uh, you talk a lot about the parallels between uh, the autumn season of the 20s and then the autumn season here in the 90s and then, of course, the winter season of the 30s and the winter season that uh, we are currently in. 
You know, in the in the 30s, we saw rising uh, geopolitical tensions. We saw uh, fringe uh, politicians with, with with fringe or extreme views uh, come to power. We're now seeing uh, Japan and China. There there are tensions. Uh, the presidential candidates in the United States are talking about getting tough with China. Are we heading down a very dangerous road here worldwide? Well, I think as the as the depression uh, really does manifest itself in throughout the world, yeah, we you know, I mean, we we will see a, a lot more aggressiveness. I've always kind of considered China to be the Japan of the 30s, you know, where you, you know to focus attention externally out of the country when you have internal problems, economic problems. You know, countries t- tend to resort to that kind of tactic. And uh, so Japan became very aggressive in the 30s. And I could see the same thing happening this time around with China. You know, China probably wants water, so Myanmar, you know, the Irrawaddy and, uh, and that kind of thing, China moving it down in there and also trying to sort of control the China Sea for, you know, oil exploration and so on. So, I could, yeah, I could see a lot of aggression occurring. And... Um, uh, to, to sort of focus uh, the country, the, the people's attention externally and, and keep it from not being focused on the problems at home. And uh, in, the, in the little time we have left here, certainly uh, China's economy is suffering. Uh, I read a Business Insider article that I talked about on last week's program. Uh, China's trade balance, China's industrial profits have gone negative. Uh, the Chinese economy seems to be be crashing. What's your view? Um, well, I think yeah, it, you know, it's it's a, a perfect example, really, of malinvestments. You know, just basically spending money on things that don't really make sense. I mean, building cities where no one lives, and and building, you know, I think Khrushchev said, you know, uh, you know, building bridges where there are no rivers and this kind of thing. It's just a, a perfect example of bad investment, and bad investment always leads to bad, you know, bad economic problems and to financial issues and banking problems. So I think China's uh, going to face its baptism as far as much as we're all going to go through the same problem. The problem really is that. Well, Ian Gordon, we're going to uh, leave it there. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and uh, always a pleasure. Hope you'll come back. Well, thank you for having me. Everything Financial Radio will return after these words. Stay with us. I-